Thank you very much all for coming. Today is a pleasure to host Arka Prava Roy from the University of Florida, Department of Biostatistics. So Arka Prava did his PhD in North Carolina State University, and then moved to Duke for his postdoc. And recently he joined the Biostats Department at the University of Florida, and today will be describing us some work on imaging data. So thank you very much. Uh, this is yours. Uh, thank you, like thank panelists for like uh, only like inviting me me here. It has been a great uh, great experience to meet all of you. Um, and Especially the temperature. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I I lo love to come back here in the summer time as well. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so today uh, I'll talk about uh, this work. Uh, it's uh, the title is very long, uh, but I will describe each part one after the other. What I usually like essentially mean by this. So it's on a double soft thresholded multigroup model for vector valued image regression with application to DTI imaging. So this is a joint work with my collaborator and friend uh, Joe Land. He is an assistant professor in the in the Harvard Medical School. Uh, so in this work, first I'll I'll, I'll I'll like describe the real data motivation, which is essentially, like essentially motivated this model, and then I propose the model and then show some results in the simulated data set as well as in the real data and some of the future direction that we can take after this work. Uh, so our so this work is uh, motivated to study Alzheimer's disease, and the data that we used uh, is collected by this uh, Alzheimer's disease, disease like neuroimaging neuroimaging initiative, uh, also called ADNI. Uh, in ADNI, there are a lot of data. Like it's a public repository of brain imaging data, and it triggered a lot of research in the in like Alzheimer's disease research in general. Um, so in this particular work. I only focus on these uh, three types of predictor. ADNI is huge, it's a many data. But with, as a response uh, variable, I will use this mini mental state exam uh, data. And for the predictor, we have two types of predictor. One is high dimensional and another, and the, another one is low dimensional. High dimensional is, a, is the white matter alignment data, which is extracted from this, this like diffusion weighted MRI images. And for the low dimensional predictor, I used I use eight six APOE gene profile and some clinical group group indicator. Uh, this APOE gene has been found to be extremely associated with DAD, so this is one of the prime uh, prime variable for the AD modeling. Um, so the MMSE is actually a set of set of set of like eleven question. So you have like a uh, spread like a sheet of uh, 11 questions on these uh, different types of things like knowing the date and where you are, the attention, concentration, short-term memory, uh, language skill, visual, visual, visual like special ability, and the ability to understand and, and follow, follow instruction. So the total score, to, the total maximum score is 30. So usually if we are like normal cognition people, then the score, you should all, always score more than 25. And uh, anything below 25 is cognitively impaired. And usually the 80 patients usually score less than 16. So this is one of the scores that is used to understand a person's cognitive functioning. Um, then the diffusion MRI, although this uh, two slides I'll, I'll like describe uh, like the imaging data that I'm using. Uh, this is particularly not that much important for this work, but this is like to give an idea like what this data is essentially. So diffusion MRI is a little bit different from the from the usual MRI. So in the, in the usual usual MRI, we just uh, acquired the image under a fixed radiant strength, like the, there is a fixed radiant uh, value that is applied on this person and the image is collected. But this diffusion MRI, uh, it is different. Uh, it's actually collected on different uh, magnetic strength and in different magnetic magnetic field radiant direction. So a person is inside uh, this this MRI machine longer, like thirty minutes or something. And in that during during that period, uh, the the machine applies different amount of magnetic strength and the different amount of uh, pulse gradient, uh, like different direction of the pulse pulse gradient. Now, um, now the image that you get 
is the is this like norm signal which is collected at at every voxel uh, so v stands for the voxel and b vector stands for the b times a which is the magnetic strength and the and and the and the like the direction so so if if the image is collected at zero gradient so this is what you usually get in the in the in the like mri not like normal mri and in diffusion we we extract both of the two two types of images one is under some uh, zero, so like zero gradient, and also some non-zero gradient with some direction. Uh, now, to extract a feature from this data, this is one of the very popular model that is applied on on this data. So, uh, and this model is called the DTI imaging model. So, where it assumes that the signal, the uh, the like the, no, the normalized signal uh, in expectation. Uh, follows this attenuation function. Uh, why attenuation? Because as you increase the B, this thing in, uh, decreases. So as you the gradient strength increases, at uh, some of those voxels, the signal will not in, in like in like in all of them, the like the signal will actually decrease as that B increases. Now our main uh, inference would be on this uh, on this matrix, this MB, which is the PD matrix. So you, you you actually collect this data for multiple values of B, and now you, you can use that, that data uh, to estimate A and V for each voxel. So these are the B and A are all like known, known things, and MB is the only unknown thing. People usually use the, the log transformation and then fit a linear regression to, to get the values of MB. And the only restriction is that MB is a PD, 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 PD matrix. And there are now some new techniques called Hardy technique, which uh, applies much more general model for this data. But it is for just for data extraction. Before I miss the rest, uh, what does that measure? You know, what kind of characteristics? Yeah, so this is actually the, like the norm, uh, norm diffusion. It measures the norm diffusion. So the, the, the water will actually diffuse in like different direction, the X, Y, Z. And this actually measures like the norm, like the X square plus Y square plus Z square square root. So just um, uh, computes the norm diffusion. Okay. Which gives you information on. Yeah, so in the in the image, you cannot really uh, Sorry, not, extract the. I don't know very much about image analysis. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, so the image, you only get some like, like this, like, like, like scalar scalar contrast value. So from that scalar contrast, you need a data extraction model to actually understand the, the, like the directional component because from an image, you cannot directly get the directional component. You get some scalar values. So to extract that directional component, it actually applies this model. And I'll go quickly like how to get the di direction component from, from this uh, PD matrix. Actually, this PD matrix is used to extract out that, that directional component. So after, so there is uh, one small detail is that, so as I already said that this is a norm signal, like the X, Y, Z square root. And so um, if we assume that there is the Gaussian, di Gaussian diffusion, like X, Y, and Z both are Gaussian, then, then the square root of, then the square is like chi square and the square root of chi square is the, is the popular like rise distribution. So the, one another way is to like assume that S B V follows a rice distribution and estimate the parameters for, from there. So the final goal is to estimate uh, this M V. Uh, now after we we estimate the M V, it is known that uh, water diffuses uh, actually along the along the white matter. So if it is white matter, then water diffuses along the white matter. If it is non-white matter, like gray matter or something, then the, then water can diffuse in any direction. So it is more anisotropic along the fiber. So that is the main information we usually use. So, so in order to do that, we actually do the eigen decomposition of this estimated MVs. So the eigen decomposition essentially will tell us the, that the principal eigen vector essentially tell us the direction of the fiber because that is the direction where the water is like diffusing the most. So the, the direction the water is diffusing diffusing the most is give, give, gives us the direction of water uh, like the fiber direction. So essentially that is the data that we use. Uh, so the whole in the in the whole brain the fiber looks like this. 
Now, if we if we zoom, so the colors essentially are just to show that whether the z direction is important or the x direction is important, kind of thing. And then if we if we look at each fiber, then the fiber looks like this. Now, if I zoom in more, then it looks like this. That like within each fiber, so this is a fiber. So we, we start from a seed voxel and try to see which. So for, for, for example, if we start from this seed voxel, then it directs to this that this point. So it take to take this route like this. So, so we, when, when, we, when we do the fiber tracking, we actually start from a seed voxel and follow the, the principal diffusion direction that is estimated from MV and follow that route and to identify these fibers. And if we do that in the whole brain, the whole brain looks like that. So essentially, this is this is the data that we use. That is for each voxel, then we have a diffusion direction data. Um, so essentially, at each voxel, that's why we have a vector value data. It's not just a scalar value that we have. So values of three things. Um, okay. Now the main inferential goals here is are two brain regions that have significant association with the MMSC. And also, this is a multi-group scenario because we have different different clinical groups. And here, the clinical groups are: uh, we have the early mildly cognitive impaired EMCI, the late mildly cognitive impaired LMCI. I missed an L here, uh, and then the Alzheimer disease. So it starts from healthy. From healthy, it is uh, early MCI, then late MCI, then AD. So this uh, EMCI, LMCI, and AD. These these three are our three clinical groups, and the Idea is also to identify the similarities and the differences between these three groups, whether how much they are similar in their impact on the MMSC. Are those groups defined by the MMSC? Uh, a different. Yeah, of course. Like I mean, uh, one can. Uh, so when the doctors essentially identify these groups, so when the when doctors essentially identify them, they they make several measurements. It's not just MMSC. Otherwise, it would have been bad for the analysis if it is just based on MMSC. But they use a lot of clinical pathological features to place someone in these three things. Um, okay. um, so in a in a usual route of inference, what has been done so far with this type of data is that first you get the get this uh, tractography uh, result, then you parcelate the brain into different parts, and then calculate the number of fibers that connect different regions, and that you would actually give you this uh, connectome low dimensional summary networks, which are like connectome matrices. So for each subject, we get these connectome matrices and that has been used as a predictor for this MMSC as all has been used. But the, 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 the issue with this kind of summarization is that you have the you have the whole brain image data, which you are essentially summarizing to into some matrices. So that actually lose a lot of information uh, while do this summarization, we do this low dimensional summarization. So, um, so here, that's why we try to use the image data directly instead of doing any kind of summarization doing this. Um, so in mathematical terms, the, our model has a scalar uh, response, which is YI um, for ith subject. And then I denote the DIV uh, as the vector valued predictor at, at the VIAD, VIAD voxel. And uh, so for now, I am ignoring the low dimensional predictor and focusing more on the imaging, just um, make it simpler. And then the P is the total number of imaging locations that we have in the data. So uh, apart from the application that I will like describe in this talk, uh, one can also use like colored images. So if you have uh, colored images as like predictor and you have a scalar response, you want to regress the scalar response on the colored images, that's also fall, falls under this kind of framework because the colored images re require three component, uh, red, green, blue. So we have three things at each pixel, look at, at each box or pixel location. So yeah, that's the more general. Um, now this is the model. So this is a essentially a linear linear regression model, but I'll put structures later. But this is essentially a linear regression model where we have the imaging predictors and we have this regression co coefficient. Uh, only difference is that the regression coefficients are again like vector valued. 
because the predictor is like vector valued. So the imaging uh, at the imaging at the, every location we have a vector valued coefficient. Since there are three things, uh, so there will be three things in each beta g, uh, v j, and 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 it is commonly like scaled down the total impact of that particular image by square root of p by because the image in in general uh, image has like thousands of voxels. So if we just take the sum and do that, then it will be like a huge number. So it is usually commonly to scale it down so that uh, these coefficients are substantially large. Otherwise, it will be too small if, if it doesn't sell because of the sheer um, like size of the image. Uh, and, and we have here uh, group specific, we have three clinical groups. So we have group specific separate uh, intercept uh, and, and slope. So, so these coefficients are made group specific. Um, Okay. So now the desirable properties that I essentially imposed with you through priors. Um, so the first is that since we want to do selection, we want to identify the brain regions that have significant effect on the scalar response. We want this beta GV to be zero at, at several of those locations because we want to do selection. Um, first to that, and secondly, we want beta GV to be smooth because uh, images, the DI, VJ, these images are very smooth. So if you take two pixel location, the image do not like change randomly, it just changes, but changes smoothly. So that's the reason we expect that beta GV should also be smooth. So there are, these two are the primary uh, like properties that we want to impose in our prior, that beta GV will be zero. So there will be a shrinkage. Um, so beta GV will be zero. Like, throughout the, the, all three vectors will be zero. And then it should be continuous that uh, if two pixel, if two voxel locations are closed, then the corresponding value should also be closed. It should not be any haphazard changes. Um, so in summary, beta G should be sparse, continuous, and piecewise, piecewise smooth. Um, now, to ensure this piecewise smoothness, I'll use this uh, soft, uh, soft thresholding type uh, sparsity. So this has been used um, in the frequency setting in, in various problems. Recently also uh, a soft thresholded uh, Gaussian process has been used in spatial variable selection. And our approach also uses this, uh, uh, this, this structure. And we, we use it in a vector valued situation as well as we also further uh, extend it for a multi-group setting. Um, and I'll, I'll discuss the motivation behind that. What is the main thing? So in case of, so this is our, our um, soft thresholding um, function. So essentially what it does is that, uh, so you have, a, you have a vector X. Now, if the norm of that vector is less than a certain value, I'll make that vector zero altogether. So in pictorially, if we have if we have like two um, two components, like like the Q is two, there are only is the only vector. Then if the uh, if the if the if the, if the like threshold parameter lambda uh, is two, then if we have two vectors, the red are like original vectors. Now since this vector is inside the circle, this will be transferred back to zero. Uh, by this soft, soft thresholding uh, operation. But if the vector is outside of the circle right here, then the, then the direction of the vector remains the same, but the magnitude of the vector will actually shrink. So it essentially shrinks um, the norm of that vector. And, uh, and if the norm is less than lambda, then the vector is completely shrink to zero. So this transformation we use to to model the model the, uh, the like the sparsity component uh, of the, of that of, of the of, of our beta, and uh, since we are like essentially shrinking the norm of that vector, we we are calling it uh, soft thresholded L two norm transformation uh, ht two n. That's where the name comes from. And uh, so that's why our so in a in a single group setting, if we have a vector valued Imaging predictor and one group, we can we can use this transformation to model where beta tilde v will be an unshrinked coefficient, and then you apply this uh, soft thresholding operation, and then you get 
the beta will be there in the model and the, the prior would be coming from this transformation. So we can use any kind of uh, functional prior for beta tilde V because we want the smoothness uh, in the second property is the smoothness. So if, um, if this is smooth, beta tilde V is smooth, then H lambda B tilde V would also be piecewise smooth because it's, yeah. So this actually preserves the, the Lipschitz type continuity. Um, and we also use Gaussian process to, for modeling beta tilde V. That's why we usually call our, our, our overall prior as uh, ST2 and GP prior. And there are some few more examples that uh, I just use the like, same two original rate vectors and then apply a different amount of shrinkage just to show that how different amount of shrinkage affects the vector. As you can see that as the shrinkage decreases, uh, the original vectors, the length of the original vector increases. So one can use, and also for example, this vector is, is mapped to zero for these two cases, but here, this is not mapped to zero. This is mapped to something, something right here. So the, um, by tuning the Lambda parameter, we can actually tune the amount of shrinkage we want. We, if we want too much shrinkage, you can use a larger lambda or, or you can reduce it as, as you want. Um, okay. Now, um, the extension to the multi-group setting. So what we expect is that, well, all of these three, three clinical groups have different amount of effect on the scalar, but this effect should not be too far different from, from this from from these clinical groups, they should not be very different. Like if if in if in one group a particular brain region is important, in the other groups it may be slightly less important, but it should not be like this not important at all. So it should not be independent. Like the the, the, the beta G should not be completely independent. If we have independence, then it be a, a problem as well because like new like new neuroimaging data are usually like sparse like there are not many subjects in this type of data so in this particular data, data set also for each group we have only 30 subject so 30 subject is not very large to estimate this high dimensional coefficients so if you have some kind of sharing of information across these different clinical groups that actually helps to kind of understand to kind of get the better estimates of of things so one can potentially model the beta G as, as like independent or some independent latent beta tilde G and then apply the transformation. But we actually didn't, we actually added more structure to it by, by assuming that beta tilde G is actually sum of a shared beta tilde V, which is shared by all the groups. And then, uh, then uh, another function, which is alpha G V. Now the idea here is that make alpha G V even more sparse. So it's like, uh, it's like they have the, they have the shared latent function across the all clinical groups. Now, in the in a group level, you just add an additional, uh, additional you add some effect for group specific. But these are more sparse, like sparse. Like it's like they have a they have a, it's essentially um, uh, kind of centered the latent structure of all these groups, and then add little bit of little bit of this like perturbation. Uh, along the way. And these perturbations are also smooth as well as sparse. So that's why the double soft thresholding thing comes in that the, we apply the two, two, two soft thresholding operator. One is in the group specific level and then apply another thresholding in the overall, overall sum. And this actually, uh, and I did not check the prediction before, but later on I checked the prediction uh, and this type of uh, information sharing actually helps in the prediction a lot. Um, performance. So this is the our uh, extension for the multi-group setting. Now, uh, so now uh, these are some from, from a clinical uh, inference uh, point of view. This is something that we use. Uh, is that this is something that for each spatial location uh, v, uh, we define this uh, psi v, which is the minimum across all all pair of group 
this uh, norm distance. So if, if since they, all of these beta g, the effects that we estimate are, are all like vectors. So if the if if in one group the one of the beta one is in pointing this direction and beta two pointing in this direction, they are sort of orthogonal. So that so that so the inner product of these two coefficients essentially will tell us that how much similar they are. So if at a specific location v, if beta one uh, v and beta two v, the like the inner product are uh, are close. That means that uh, like like the like inner product are positive and large. Uh, uh, then they are, it will tell us the uh, kind of their angle is is small, and then they are sort of aligned. So they are sort of similar effect. The direction of the effect are sort of similar. So now I compute this inner product uh, for each pair of g and g g prime, and take the minimum over that because the minimum essentially will tell us the maximum possible separation among these groups. So, so if, if there are three vectors g1, g2, g3, and if we compute for each pair like g1, g2, g2, g3, and g1, g3, the one that is the minimum uh, in terms of the inner product, the, those two groups uh, have the largest separation in their effect. So essentially this, this component uh, will tell us uh, it kind of summarizes uh, the all set of groups together, sort of. Uh, and we also broke this result. This is a very intuitive uh, result, is that uh, if this uh, psi v component increases at v -th voxel, now if the total effect uh, at v -th voxel for group two is negative, then the group one uh, being positive, actually that probability goes to zero. So the two groups will, because, because uh, uh, beta G transpose V DV is the overall effect of VF voxel. So whether that voxel is giving a positive effect to the response or the negative effect of the response that comes from the sign of, 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 of this particular component, which is the effect of VF voxel. So, yeah. Now the prior, but up until that, if you have any questions, then I can. I guess uh, <clears throat> you have if you, if you have three groups, uh, not three groups. Uh, you have three directions. You have three Gaussian processes mm. defined, right? Mm. So are they related somehow? Yeah, so that's what I'm coming in from the prior. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this uh, beta tilde that um, that is the latent um, Gaussian latent uh, multivariate Gaussian process that we assume. Uh, we 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 assume that the Gaussian process the the, the covariance kernel. Is a, is a like inner uh, the, uh, tonical product of sigma and kappa. So kappa is the um, Gaussian kernel for, for for each one of them the same. And then the sigma essentially um, brings the correlation in their in their component direction. So the the, 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 the association between these different components is controlled by uh, sigma, and then for and kappa controls the overall smooth like smoothness of each one of them. Um, and for rest of the parameters, I essentially used uh, the prior that would make the computation easy, like the one the sampling much simpler. Um, and for the code for the sigma, um, I, I I also added the conjugate Wishart prior. Um, and and since the imaging data are all like huge, so I use the like low rank approximation of the process to make the computation uh, quicker. I have little bit uh, of detail in the low rank approximation. My paper has more details. It's it's primarily like you have a whole, so it's actually useful in, like specifically for imaging data, but because for image data is already already in a very, very like gridded gridded structure. So you have these grid images, and then you identify some of the inner grid points and sort of uh, assume that they have a latent Gaussian process at those inner grid and all the other grid points are sort of like extrapolated, like the, the, the points which are outside of the grid, but inside of the image, the effect of those like, like here, so, so this is the uh, value in the image and this is the grid grid point values and we are sort of like smooth them out to get, uh, get the uh, in, interpolate, like extrapolate outside of the grid. So that actually like reduces the dimensionality a lot because the images are usually super smooth. So this kind of coefficients are also very smooth. So that's this kind of helps to also bring in the smoothness even 
even better and reduce the computational burden quite a lot. Uh, and a similar thing we also use for all, all the alpha j's as well to model computation. Uh, for posterior computation, we use MCMC and give sampling whenever it is possible with conjugate structure. For beta G, uh, since we have this uh, transformation in it, so we use the LMC uh, sampling for that. And all the other parameters, uh, we, I use the MH, this metropolis listings update. Uh, those uh, and also prove the posterior consistency uh, result and there uh, um, I mean one 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 different thing that we did was uh, uh, so the predictors we assume that the predictors have some underlying correlation and uh, it is the predictors correl correlation that essentially drive uh, the dependence in the beta so we kind of use that fact into the into a result that essentially helped us proving this theoretical results that the predictor itself are the the the, the, the spatial uh, there is a like there is like very high spatial dependence in the predictor itself which is essentially driving uh, the dependence in in beta okay uh, now the simulation so we carry out uh, two simulation setting the first simulation setting that we have um I, I, okay there is one simul there, there are a few similarities between the two sim two simulation setting firstly the the imaging predictors are all three dimensional and i use this uh, very small images like 20 cross 20 equispace grid uh, in order to replicate it several number of times uh, for simulation um and also we have uh, three many three groups and each group has either 50 or 100 observations um, then we did generate the data under uh, different values of the noise noise variance. So this will essentially control the signal signal to noise ratio. Um, higher variance will lead to lower noise uh, lower signal to noise ratio. And then the beta g's the true coefficients are all um, kept the same for both of the two simulation settings. It's only the uh, imaging predictors are generated differently for the two cases. So, so these are so these are the uh, true betas. So these are here. I have plotted the norm uh, because beta is a is a like a three dimensional vector at at each location. It's hard to plot that. So I just plotted the norm uh, at each at each voxel. Um, so as you can see that there are some shared things like this. This blob is shared by all of them, and also this uh, this blob is shared by one and two but this is something that we expect in the in the real data as as well that this should be the case so this is the true beta that we use in both of the two simulation settings now in the first case uh we generate we actually use the the like the yeah the spatial location the 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 data is a unit vector which is essentially our real data is that at each uh at each word uh, i mean like like location in the brain, we have a three-dimensional vector pointing to the white ma white matter fiber. So the data is like unit vector. So that's what we try to maintain in this setting. Um, so here we come. I compared it with these three methods, and as we uh, have increasing sample size, it beats. Uh, so I it is a the result is quite in, like encouraging in comparison to other uh, I, at this time i did not do any kind of prediction but later on i added prediction for the real data which was amazingly better if we have the uh, multi group type of model um, but it's still better here and for the se second simulation i just generated the uh, predictor processes from some underlying uh, gaussian process and then also uh, multiply it with some marginal variance to bring dependence among those processes. So I generate three Gaussian processes uh, and then just multiply this matrix to add the dependence, and it will be like a multi, um, yeah, multivariate Gaussian essentially in this case, the predictors. And in that case, also our model performs much better in order in in S2. so so this is these values are the estimation M msc so you have the beta zero and the beta hat and i just compute the the norm separation between beta zero and beta um, and, yeah. 
and 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 also we we show that this is the true estimate and this is the um, uh, so this is the true value this is the estimated so there is enough in the paper we uh, we also have a kind of derived result to identify the the shared effect directly from those beta tilde so we have those beta tilde which was shared in the in the in the modeling state if we can use the beta tilde somehow to identify the shared effect directly we derive some result on that and we use that and I find that is actually could identify the shared effect location I'm not going into detail for that, um, but yeah, it, is, it worked there. Um, okay, now the ADNI application. Now the ADNI ap application, uh, as I already mentioned, that there are three clinical groups that we use, uh, AD, EMCI, and LM LMCI for easy, re easy reference. And uh, there are a number of studies which uh, showed association uh, between MMAC um score with apoe stat status age and gender um so we decided to adjust for this predictors um in like overall effect of these predictors first and then do the group specific model um so our model for the uh, our adni data is is this that we have uh so the age uh, gender and the apoe status status has uh, has like uh, like overall effect coefficient, not group specific, and then the intercept and the imaging predictor has the group specific component because they are already established that it has effect. And I have uh, so this APOE gene has three allele. One is allele two, three, and four. So it has been found that the allele two is protective of uh, the disease, and allele four is the most harmful one the most risky one and the allele 3 is sort of like neutral so it's usually the while coding this variables usually the allele 3 is some mostly used to to create to make the baseline and then two and three are the effects that's why i i also did the same the allele 3 is the baseline and two and four is in the model um so yeah so after applying this um and 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 and, and specifically so this is a uh, spe like special case that the DIVs are three-dimensional unit vector in our particular case. So at each uh, imaging location, if we estimate the DIV transpose beta V, uh, it can be decomposed like this. One is the norm of beta and then the cosine uh, of these two vector. So essentially, uh, it, it gives a very nice interpretation that beta norm V essentially tells us the overall effect of that particular vo voxel and uh, and this component essentially tell us but this I mean, this value ranges between minus one to one so this value essentially tell us the individual specific changes of that value so beta beta norm b tell us the overall effect across the population and then this cosine matrix essentially tell us the uh, individual specific changes from that value in the range of minus one to one so for some people, it may be negative, or some people positive, and also we can convert it into percentage difference as well because it's like already not like normalized. Um, I mean, we did not use it as such, but I'm just like for inference purposes, it's very useful. Um, okay, so uh, we actually applied our model for uh, different brain masks, the di different brain parts of the brain region. Uh, for this presentation, I would only discuss the, the the results we got for the corpus callosum. So corpus callosum is is a is, 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 is like is a region with around thirteen thousand uh, voxels. So which is right inside uh, of the brain, which has the largest white matter mass yeah, yeah, throughout. And uh, this is like one of the since it has the largest white, so white matter essentially is the part of the brain that actually processes the signal because the white matter essentially transmits the signal from one part of the other. So uh, if if a brain is functioning very nicely, that means that uh, like white matter density of that overall is very high, and there is like a very nice connectivity across these brains. So corpus callosum plays a very important role in that. Um, so in that uh, estimate, we find that um, the gender, age, and uh, sorry, this should be allele two. Uh, in uh, gender, age, and allele 
4 uh, have found, found to be significant and um, age and allele 4 are negative, which makes sense because these are allele 4 has like uh, it's a very risky uh, allele for the AD. And then the age is also negative, which makes sense. Like we, as we age, our cognitive function little bit decays. So that makes sense. And the gender has this effect. Uh, I think I coded uh, one as the female and zero as the male. And then um, this is it should be a little two, and we didn't have much much effect because zero is included in the credible interval. Now this is the estimated part. So the shared uh, is again based on that metric that we uh, I, I identified, and we find that uh, this in AD there are six point sixty eight percent of the regions got selected. Uh, in EMC it is nine point nine four, and ELMC eight point two eight percent region selected and there and among this region there are like 4.48 percent regions are, are like sort of shared so that essentially also motivates us more that this kind of multi-group model makes sense because uh, the regions that is selected by in the ad group or in the emci group and the lmci group they are not completely like different from each other there are some similarity which sort of helps in the estimation if we can use that somehow and one more thing is that uh, EMCI has the larger number of percentages important and then LMCI then AD. And this is some, this is a trend that I observed in all the brain regions that I have studied using this model. And there are a few other uh, things that we also have seen along the way is that um, uh, like the, uh, also like the, gen, uh, in the, the table to fold Okay, we'll there. Uh, there was one more thing is that um, yeah, I think I have not mentioned it here. So the, uh, it's all, all, always the lower part of this uh, fiber tract that had more um, more selection than the upper tract. Um, I mean the, the tracts that are closer to the to the to the inner part of the brain. That is also something that we observe. Uh, all, although you have to study more on this to understand, get a bit of deeper understanding on this. Um, yeah, the rest of the things I already mentioned. And we also did up, so this is the prediction, out of sample prediction that we tried. So this STGP is a sort of analog to our case, uh, but the STGP essentially uses, uh, it is not for vector valued image, it's for uh, scalar valued image. So I used STGP for as like we have three different images. So for each X coordinate, we have an image, Y coordinate, we have an image, Z coordinate, we have an image. And we have three different images. And the STGP is also not for the uh, multi-group setting, it's a single group setting. So we applied this three imaging, with three imaging predictors, we have applied for these three groups separately and, uh, and estimated the out of sample prediction. Uh, it was quite larger than the when I applied our multi-group ST2N. So essentially, uh, like uh, using structure more of the data helps in getting much better prediction um, than if we just throw them like in independently without including the structure. Yeah, and there are several uh, extensions that we're planning. One is that so ST2 transformation is a very general transformation. That I mean, we use like Gaussian process, but Gaussian process makes things like notoriously slow because the volume of computation. So we are planning to use some other ways to model that latent uh, beta tilde, uh, which will be computationally much more uh, easier to, to, to handle. And uh, we use the DTI, this DTI marker, the principal diffusion direction. So it's not the only marker that you can use. There are several other things that you also can use, like for example, or that MV that I showed, the PD matrix of which we apply the eigen decomposition to get the principal diffusion direction. We can probably use that MV directly um, as a predictor. Then it will not be a three-dimensional uh, predictor, it will be a six-dimensional because the three cross three PD matrix at six independent component. So that way there are some possibilities. And, and also on another, this is an important thing specifically for DTI imaging because in the in DTI, we always find uh, dependence along a fiber tract. But in our case, we, we introduce the dependence 
in a like a Euclidean distance. So it essentially a geospatial dependence, which may not be appropriate for DTI because in DTI, the mostly the dependence is found along the track. So it may be more accurate to do that in, instead of what we, had, what we did so far. So this is something that also we are planning to yes. And this paper is in archive, if you're interested to check. And yeah, thank you. And any question? Does anyone have any questions? Um, yeah, I have one. Um, sorry, my memory have missed. So you talked about uh, regions that are shared, like something 4% for, uh, and then the rest is not shared, which implies that your betas are set to zero somehow. Uh, not necessarily. So the way the shared is usually defined is a little bit different. It may happen that in one of the clinical group, the beta G is, is directed like this, let's say, and in the other, in the other group, it is directed completely opposite. So that means that in one group, the effect, so in one group, the effect is sort of in the, uh, in let's say the, in some direction in the other group, it is completely opposite direction. Then also we do not consider that, that, that location to be shared. So shared is more, more or less like if, if all the groups are, and the, and the effect direction of all the groups are sort of close to each other, it is not too far away from that like directional sense. So the inner product, if we compute uh, beta one and beta two, firstly, they should not be negative. If beta one transpose beta two is negative, that means that one is completely opposite to the other. So that's, that's we do not want. But, so they are not shared. So they say it did not necessarily zero, but it can be non-zero, but, uh, but if I think from a uh, scalar point of view, so if effect in one group is, let's say two, and another is minus three, so we don't consider them to be a similar effect because it's completely opposite effect. So, yeah, so yeah, I, I may not have mentioned that at all. <laughs> Thanks for mentioning. I didn't understand, maybe because it was a bit small. How are you evaluating the predictions? Oh, uh, I did not mention the, what what I did. I, I just predicted the MMSC value using mm -hmm. our model and, uh, and also using the STGP model, mm -hmm. and then 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 keep calculating the prediction MSC. So the we get some MS, mm -hmm. MMSC hat and MMSC, and mm -hmm. this is a, a out of sample. So we like separated out five subject uh, in the in that pool and use the rest of so so we have three clinical groups so we like we have 30 subjects in each group so leave out five of them so we have 25 each uh so use that data to fit and then to find and also http the the way it is set up it does not like the code the available code that we have it does not allow to adjust for the other predictors so while doing the prediction comparison I also did not, I also did, I also did not use that. So for this prediction, I only use the imaging data as the predictor. I did not use the age, gender, because the current code of STGP does not allow that. So for a fair comparison. Okay, so you haven't used the, the, the whole ability of your model in that sense to be better than that. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I just use the same set of predictors, only the image predictors and nothing else, just to make it a fair comparison. Um, yeah. So maybe having the additional predictor even in, I mean, like decrease this error even lower. But, yeah. So this is for a particular part of the brain, which is what I mentioned. Is yeah. So for this uh, result, I only use the corpus callosum um, as the, the like the voxels within the corpus callosum as the predictor, which has around like thirteen thousand. Uh, voxels, not the whole brain. Um, How long does it take for 13,000? Um, it's a good question. I think it takes uh, around 13 hours. I think 14. <laughs> yeah. Right. You've looked at these different uh, predictors. Is there a clinical significance that you can say 
you know, there's there's something going on in this area of the brain. Is it? What's the? Uh, yeah, I mean, so we actually treated. So we actually treated this model for five different white matter tracts. So those five different white matter tracts are actually the five five different white matter masks actually. So they are different ROIs that have already been identified responsible for cognition. So all of these five. Uh, so we got some interesting results that we have added in the paper. So all of these five uh, regions that we essentially analyzed, so they are they all all start from the inside part of the brain and then goes out. And what we found is that the the brain regions which are like inside, they are getting selected more than the outside. So that's something we found, and maybe we need to uh, run some more analysis to actually make it as valid scientifically correct statement but yeah that is something that we found that the inner part of the brain are getting more selected as more association with mmsc is there a reason why that might be uh, so one thing that we found is that so um so there's one metric that uh, people usually use for dti data it's called the fractional anisotropy which is like um I can't go back. So, in which is like the so in that in that MV that I showed the three D which is the main source of this data. So the eigenvalues that we get, we can actually compute the standard deviation of this of this eigenvalue. So if the standard de deviation of the eigenvalue is large, that means that the the data is uh, is like the like the direction the lambda one the first eigenvalue is quite larger than the other so it, as you can imagine if lambda one is equal to lambda two is equal to lambda three then the in the hd will be zero so that then then the water is like diffusing in the all three direction uniformly so it is not a white matter region in the white matter region the lambda one should be very high and lambda two lambda three should go down so the standard de de deviation of this lambda one lambda la 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 lambda three will be higher in the regions where there is there is white matter, so there is this uh, is, uh, there is this uh, thing that is computed which is called fractional anisotropy, which is essentially the standard deviation of this lambda one lambda two, lambda three. So the this this FA value, the fractional uh, anisotropy, uh, is lar was larger actually for the regions that got selected. So that means that uh, so in 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 like new neuroscience. Uh, uh, FA is used to sort of quantify the white matter density. So essentially what we got is that the regions that uh, have very high white matter density are getting selected more. Uh, the inside of the brain has those areas have greater white matter density. But this FA metric is not so perfect because there can be crossing fiber, like a particular voxel can have two fibers crossing. And at that moment, the FA does not provide a good estimate of the white matter density. But yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, it's actually says that a little bit. I just ask if, if there's any, so, so the sigma is uh, constant over the brain, right? So there's an assumption of isotropy. Measurement error is, oh, actually our sigma is not even, so, uh, are you talking about this sigma, like in the model, the yi, yi, uh, the matrix? I, uh, this sigma? No, the matrix. Oh, 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 oh the, the capital sigma. Yeah. Um, yeah. That sigma. Yeah, yeah. So I was wondering if it might be a case that. I think yeah, that's that that yeah, that is actually possible. We yeah, we haven't done that. You mean like sigma should be a function of the? Um, I I know it's hard, but it's, a, it's an assumption of like isotropy here, right? Like um, mm -hmm. it's in, so I, I don't know if if what I'm saying is plausible neurologically. Uh, or, yeah. I mean, uh, well, one way could be like this. Um, yeah, I mean, allowing it to be different in different parts of the brain. I mean, yeah, makes sense. Um, because because uh, the yeah I mean I I I I have not thought about it actually so I, but it yeah could be interesting yeah I guess another thing so the, the betas that you retrieve in your simulations uh, you did you check if there are any false positives like like 
um, regions in these images that you know that are not important because so in the, yeah yeah in, in in the simulation I mean the image is too heavy. Yes. Um, so here, so this is the this is the, the the best one actually because this is the this is with the sample size of one hundred. As you can see that uh, these are the correctly identified blobs, but there are some blobs which you not probably not see from here. Uh, it did get some non-zero norm, which should not have happened because in the two doesn't have it. So uh, yeah, I mean. But if we have, I don't have the sample size 50, the estimates or samples, or I have, oh yeah, I have the sample size. It, it, it doesn't show much difference from here, but I did find that the lower sample size actually had more more blobs. Maybe in this particular example, I don't, but yeah, but yeah, that's that's totally possible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yes. As, as possible, like <laughs> the mm -hmm. sample size is very small then. But uh, the main idea here uh, in the real data application is to understand uh, the basic scientific driver. Like for example, we find that the ones, the regions that are like more inside of the brain are getting selected. So we can always like verify these findings afterwards. So that's that's sort of we have in mind to do more analysis to them. We have to. Sorry? What do you mean we can verify afterwards? Yeah, the thing is like, so we have only used the MMAC as the only response. So there are many other other, other scores like neuropsychological neuro tests. There are other course scores as well. So we, if we can find that the other with other scores uh, as the response, it's sort of pointing to the same sort of inference, then we have like more confidence in our result. Um, or yeah, because all of these scores measure different types of cognitions. It might be mm -hmm. useful to try those. Mm -hmm. And also like use other markers. We only have diffusion direction. Instead of that, uh, like the eigenvalues itself can be other type of markers from MD. If you use this the other way around to use the imaging results to classify the disease groups, because I think so far you, you uh, predicted the uh, mm uh, sorry the MMC. MMC. Uh, would it be possible to identify who belongs to each so you, of the different uh, disease groups? Yeah. So do, so do you do you mean more like a classification problem or an like unsupervised? Yeah, mm -hmm. a classification problem of who has of course. Alzheimer's, for example. I think, I think that would be very interesting. And we haven't done that because we wanted to start start with a normal regression model because this like, logistic and profit and they throw more challenges computationally. But of course, I think that's, that, that that would be very useful. I think, yeah, I think, yeah, I think we should try that, yeah. Sounds good. Oh, yeah. More questions? Yes, I think I can probably.